Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Kat McGregor, and on behalf of the Farm Advisory Service, I'd like to welcome you along to tonight's webinar on drones and devices in modern day farming. Um, our first speaker is Gavin Dick, who is head of the Farm Networks at Agri Epicentre. Um, Gavin is going to be speaking to us tonight about all things technology and the importance of technology in agriculture. He's also going to be giving us insight into some of the projects and solutions that AgriEP are currently working on um, to try and support farmers. And then after Gavin, we will have Jim Wilson, who is the Managing Director at Soil Essentials. Um, I'm extremely grateful for Jim standing in because um, our speaker who was due to speak, unfortunately, at a very last minute had to drop out. So thankfully, Jim has stepped in and he's going to be talking to us about the uses of drones and the benefits of drones in agriculture. So, folks, I'm just going to pass you on to Gavin. Um, in fact, no, just before I do that, I'm just going to ask you a quick question. Um, so quick question should just appear on your screen now, I hope. So do you consider technology to be important? OK, so 87 percent find um, technology is important in agriculture. And we've got a few that are sitting on the shelf that are really not sure. So hopefully by the end of tonight's webinar, folks, your, your um, thoughts on that may well change. So let me hand you over to Gavin, who's going to take us through his presentation. Perfect. Uh, have I got to do anything here or is it ready to go? It's ready to go. So, um, yep. evening, everybody. Uh, no pressure now after that 87% um, uh, poll <laughs> uh, reading. So, I better watch what I say. Um, I should also clarify that uh, Kat introduced me about talking about all things technology. Um, I actually know very little about the actual technology, and what I'm really going to speak about is is how you farmers can apply that technology to improve your your business, your productivity. Um, but before I get into that, I just wanted to say a quick few words about uh, Agri Epicenter. Those of you who don't know what it is, um, it's one of four uh, technology centres set up um, with government funding about three, three and a half years ago uh, to try and encourage and um, develop emerging technology in the uh, in the agri tech sector. Um, and our sort of resources are based around um, sort of physical assets, so buildings, um, resources that companies can use. So we've got a, a, an engineering base down at Harper Adams, the Midlands hub. Um, we have a, a, an arable sort of soil related facility down at Cranfield at the southern hub, where we've got a big glass house and lots of um, different sensors. And then on the livestock side, we've got um, a few different facilities. Um, we've got the Southwest Dairy Development Centre, which I'll speak about later. We also have a research dairy um, at Harper Adams at the Midlands. Um, and in the Northern Hub, we've got um, a, a large animal facility just about to open in Edinburgh, um, with a, along with a small aquaculture facility. And we also have a a calf unit um, down at Dumfries. And the last sort of resource we have is the satellite farm network, which is uh, which is really my area. I don't want to interrupt you too much. It's Malcolm here. We can't see your screen yet, so I think you might have to have a wee hunt about. There should be a box to click OK to share your screen. Have you seen that anywhere? It's saying that people can see it, so I'm not sure what. No, I can see yeah. it now. It's come through now. It so now. Yep. Yeah, okay. So, do you want me to go back and start? Uh... No, I think you're oh, all right. No, you, think you, right. You, you could hear me, so I'll just carry on. Yeah. So, the, 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 the satellite farm network um, is, uh, you can see all the different farms on the, the screen there just now. Um, and the, the, the purpose of the satellite farm network is really to um, resolve the disconnect between research and the end user. It's, it's really to try and get researchers onto farm so that they're much better connected with the needs of the farmer. Um, what they're developing technology-wise is farmer-friendly. Um, and uh, we have a range of farms uh, types from uh, large managed farms to small family farms. We've got beef, sheep, arable, 
pigs, poultry. So it's a whole range, and they're all the, the key thing is that they're all commercial farms. So if we can um, carry out uh, research based on these farms, if we can evaluate new technology with these farmers, then it, it, it gives you guys confidence that um, what's been presented to you in the in the way of technology actually works and uh, and you know, and, and it will actually do something for your, your business. And you'll probably recognize quite a few of these farmers if you read Farmers Weekly or uh, watch the awards at Agri Scott or um, the Farmers Weekly one. So, you know, they're, they're good commercial farms. Um, what we're... Uh, it's now stopped changing. Sorry, guys. My screen's locked. Right. <laughs> I told you I wasn't very good with technology. Um, so what we're, what we're trying to do uh, on these satellite farms, uh, as well as uh, host research projects, um, product evaluations, is to gather data. So we've set these farms up with a lot of data collection equipment so that we can scientifically validate the research. But we also want to use that data to try and improve the, the productivity on the farms. Um, so what we're focusing on is variance in production. So everybody knows that, you know, the the, uh, your, your, your yield is not based on the best bit of the field, it's based on the average across the field and it's the, it's the poor bits of the field that pull, pull your average down. And the same with a batch of finishing cattle. The first cattle that go away do, you know, they've performed really well. By the time the last one goes, your average live weight gain, confirmation, et cetera, is much lower than the, the first ones generally. So what we want to try and do is identify the variation but actually, as well as identify the variation, we, we also want to start looking to see how we can resolve that variation. Um, and, and that's where we really need to... A, a lot of technology will deliver a particular stream of data. So it will give you one particular um, type of information, whether it's milk yield off a robot or um, a weight gains in, in a, on a weighing machine. But what we need to do is to start to integrate all these different data streams and actually produce live management information for each individual animal, each individual field, so that you guys, farmers, can actually make better informed decisions at an early stage in the production process. And they can intervene um, with what's happening and change the ration, sort out an underlying health issue, whatever it happens to be, before the batch of cattle go to the abattoir and you hang them up and say, oh, well, we could have done better at that. You want to actually know that how they're doing it a much earlier process. And that, that saves a huge amount of cost, but also increases the, uh, the, the, the production. Um, so what we are trying to do, as I say, is... is to, and, to be honest, that's my definition of precision farming, precise farming or precision agriculture. It's not it's not um, uh, yield meters in combines or RTK steering, whatever. It's actually precise farming comes from actually giving the farmer pre precise management information to make better informed decisions. Some of the things that we are using uh, on cattle, um, I mean, the, the boluses, the um, accelerometers, neck and leg mounted accelerometers, ear tags, have been around in the dairy world for, for a few years, um, and they're well proven there, but we're now um, developing these for the, the beef sector. Um, and you have to be careful because technology, a, a lot of technology could turn out to be an expensive toy rather than a useful management tool. So you have to be very careful how you work out the cost benefit of these investments. So for example, the dairy cow outputs about 30,000 pounds per cow per year. A beef suckler cow is probably about 1,500 pounds per cow per year. Gross output from a ewe is probably down near 150, but that bolus costs the same, whether it's going into a dairy cow or a beef cow or a, a, or a ewe. So you have to be very clear what benefits you're going to get from technology and make sure that it's going to leave you an extra profit in your business. Cameras are maybe slightly different and they're much newer technology. 
uh, because the one camera can cover multiple uh, animals as opposed to one bolus or one collar per animal. Um, and the, at the moment, um, a lot of that technology has been based on uh, adult cows or adult animals, uh, and we're just really starting to build the algorithms to bring that technology into the young stock or the rearing animals. And we've just started, or we're halfway through a project to develop the algorithms for ear tags for dairy beef calves and for dairy replacements, um, so that we can actually start to monitor uh, the animals right through their, their lifetime. And, and a lot of the animals' end performance is, is, um, is influenced greatly by the, how the animals were reared in the first six months. Much less of an issue for suckler calves, but a, a huge issue for uh, artificially reared calves. And it's, it's not just the livestock sector. I know um, I presume most of uh, the audience is based in Sutherland, uh, which is predominantly livestock, but it, it's the same story in, in arable. And I'll not talk much about arable because Jim will cover that. Um, all I will say, uh, Jim, <laughs> is that it, I, I think the, the livestock guys are actually much further ahead in precision farming because they're already uh, working at individual animal level, whereas the arable guys have got a bit to catch up on because we're still, arable guys are still working at a field level and and a lot of the arable stuff is still historical rather than live data. But these are a couple, some examples of where we can actually get live information um, from the, for the arable side. Uh, these Terralytic um, sensors, to be honest, they're supposed to be commercially available, but we're still waiting on them. If they do what it says in the tin, they'll um, revolutionise what information we can get from the soil um, because it's live, different depths and a whole range, but it, it, they've still to be proven. Um, I think the what's interesting for me is the, they're now applying um, or attaching sensors to the cooters on seed drills, which is gathering live information as the seed cooter goes through the soil and it's adjusting things like um, seed depth as it goes. Um, now that's, this has been um, developed on larger seeds, so like uh, beans, peas, uh, maize, um, and, and also in countries where moisture is an issue. Um, so if it thinks there's not enough moisture, it'll, it'll push the seed further down into nearer the moisture automatically. Um, some other things that we're working on in the arable is um, robo or camera guided hose. Uh, and this one was set up to look at resistant herbicide resistant black grass. But as the environment comes much more into, uh, or will have to come much more into farmers thinking, and your choice of herbicides come, becomes less and less, um, it might be that we have to start looking at some sort of mechanical way of uh, weed control in cereals. Um, so this drill uh, is linked into the cameras, but also the tractor's RTK, um, and it actually takes in the path that the drill, you follow the tractor on the drill followed, and puts the tractor in the cultivator in exactly the same wheelings as the drill tractor. And then the cameras fine tune the, the actual time settings to run between. So that's working in a field of winter wheat behind a Vaderstat drill. Um, <clears throat> again, real-time monitoring on cattle, I think, is is really important. Um, these are beef monitor units that we helped develop with SRUC and Riches. You've probably all come across these already. Uh, Ian Green at the Korsky Monitor Farm is a big fan of them. He put one in and he's increased his um, average uh, weight for slaughtered animals by 20 kilos. Um, just by having much more detailed information about when they should be sold. Um, and the next steps is actually to to take that beef monitor unit where it's where the animal goes in to have a drink of water. So you've got it captured in a way. Uh, um, you can then start to do a lot of other things. Uh, and some of the things that we're looking at, we've just started a project called OptiBeef, which is um, putting cameras onto the back of these units that will measure the uh, 
it's actually designed to measure the, the carcass yield uh, in the live animal. And that's linked up then to the abattoir so that the, the farmer in the abattoir can actually select the, the exact time that the animal's ready. Um, you therefore reduce the risk of penalties for poor confirmation, um, overweight, whatever. Um, but you're, you're beginning to produce a constant product for the supply chain, which is a win-win on both sides. Uh, I think uh, actually Im improving the, the quality of the end product is a really useful area for technology. I'm not going to speak about tuber zone because that's a, a soil essentials product anyway, but it, it, it's really, it, it can, it will revolutionize the potato sector if once it uh, catches on, uh, once the farmers get to know about it. The one that's probably most relevant for the for you guys is the NIR sensor on the combine. So that's the bottom left-hand picture. And that's an NIR sensor mounted on the clean grain elevator in the combine. And it's actually sampling the nitrogen um, or the protein if it's in wheat uh, on the grain as it enters the, the, the tank. So in effect, every trailer load of grain that leaves the field will have a a nitrogen reading going with it. So you can then start to store, you know, 1.4 nitrogen separate from 1.7. Um, you know, we, we know that within a field, there's a, there's a big variation in nitrogen. And at the moment, you get paid on the average. But if we can start to separate the, that out from the combine, um, then you can increase the, the proportion of your crop that's going away at a malting premium versus a, uh, the, the feed price. Um, so it, it, you know, we shouldn't forget about the the end product. Um, on the, uh, this is the only drone one I've got because again, that's that's uh, Jim's bit. But uh, this is this is a really it's a sort of a pet area for me is grassland utilisation. It's the biggest crop in Scotland, and it's probably the the least best utilised uh, ac across the country. Some people are very good at it. Most people just, as long as it's green, they're happy. Um, and down in the southwest dairy, uh, where we would normally use a plate meter, we've been playing around with multispectral cameras uh, to try and, and measure the the dry matter in the in the grass. Um, now it's not been a complete success because th at the moment multispectral cameras are very expensive and very heavy. Um, so that drone there will only do about a seven minute flight um, on its battery because of the weight of camera it's carrying. But there's cameras coming through which are about um, 150 grams, which are multispectral and, and also coming in at about five, 6,000 pounds. Still very much in the development stage, but it's not going to be long before the camera technology you know, becomes available to to farming in general, as opposed to just the the specialist areas. And the interesting thing for me, and it makes sense if you think about it, is what what this exercise did was show how uh, inaccurate the plate meter is. Now, the plate meter in itself is not it is very accurate, but it it's only measured in the bit that you put the plate down on. And uh, human nature, being as it is. Uh, you, you would always tend to put the plate down on a what you thought was an average piece of grass, but in reality is probably um, a, a better piece. Using imagery, you can actually uh, you're you're looking at the whole field, so you're you're measuring the poor bits and the good bits equally, and getting a much more accurate average. Um, and as I say, it was quite interesting. The, the manager down there thought he was doing a good job with the plate meter until we saw the results of the, the camera. So, so I, I think you know, image imagery camera technology is is really the, you know, where the, the direction that um, the, that advances in in agritech is going to take. At, certainly at farm level over the next few years. <clears throat> so, the I, I wanted to finish on. Um, uh, this one. This is our Southwest Dairy Development Centre um, down in uh, Somerset, and the, I, I, I know there's not very many dairies in Sutherland, uh, if any. But 
it, I, I don't, the message I want to put over from this is not about dairy in per se, but it, it's what goes into this unit, how this unit, how we've approached setting this unit up. To me, it sort of illustrates or epitomizes what all farmers are going to have to strive towards over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and, it, and it's just about thinking differently and seeing where you can actually use technology um, to help manage a, a complete unit. Um, this is the first fully autonomous dairy unit in the UK. There's one other one in Europe, which is in Holland. Um, but it, if you start with things like the, the building, um, so it, it's a fabric building. Um, it's not um, fibre cement, roof sheets. It's actually three layers of fabric. And, and the three layers of fabric, the, the, the material chosen is designed to let as much natural light through as possible. So that, that not only reduces your um, electricity bill, but we all know that natural light is important in livestock production and, and animals will respond to that. It also means that your building can be very cheap because the the weight of that whole building roof, the, the material is about five, five and a half tons. If you were to cover that area with fibre cement, you'd be into the 60, 70 tons. So the, the steel work to hold up the building can also then be much lighter, um, which keeps the cost down, but it also allows you to make much more of cow flow. There's not there's not any great big H beams in the middle of the the cubicle or the or the passage that you have to avoid. Um, the the cows are all housed together, so we don't separate out the dry cows. Um, they're all kept together, uh, but they are fed separately. So if you look at the bottom left hand corner, you'll see a cow in that passage. Um, well, the cubicles are are at the far side of behind that cow, and the cow gets up out of the cubicle, heads to the milking robots, which are on the left-hand side of that picture. If if they, if she's not due... ...and different rations, um, and the cows are automatically sent into the feed bunker that's got their ration on it. Other things that are every morning when they hear the mixer wagon approaching the, the, the shed, they all get up from their cubicles or their bed and they all charge towards the, the, the feed space to get, um, to get fresh feed. Uh, and that in itself it's a stress, you know, it causes stress. Um, but because these cows are fed automatically, they're actually fed between 15 and 17 times a day. So the, the motion or the noise of the feeder doesn't have any impact because they're used to it all the time. So cows literally just get up and walk around, feed whatever when they, when they want to. Um, there are sensors in the cows which tell the system when a cow's 24 hours, when a cow's due to calve, um, so again, if you go up to, to go down to that bottom left hand pick Gavin, we're just losing your sound a little bit. It's, it's breaking up quite bad. The, there is a um, sound sand pit uh, pen where the cows can choose to go into to calve. So they'll go in there themselves. There's an on-return gate, which means they can't get out until the uh, till the stockman comes in and checks that everything's okay and releases her. Um, on the grazing system, um, we're looking at using a satellite to monitor the grazing. Now, we've not managed to just get the satellite to to get as, as accurate uh, dry matter reading as the um, uh, multispectral camera. So it, it's using NDVI technology, but the satellite's actually managing the the gates to move automatically move cattle into the different paddocks um, so that no cow spends more than eight hours in any one paddock, um, which again is all done 
um, autonomously. So it, it's really just, a, um, and, and to be honest, cost-wise, it's come out a lot cheaper than we thought. So it, it works out about £6,000 per cow space, and a conventional system can be anything from sort of five and a half to uh, £9,000 per cow space, depending on what sort of system you're using. So it, it's a, it actually is cost-effective as well. So th that last slide is really just to give you a, a taster of what's possible with technology and really where we all need to be setting our sights on sometime uh, you know, over the next number of years um, as our support system uh, evolves, as our um, requirements from our customers develop, then uh, a lot of these uh, things can, can contribute. So I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I think I'll just stop there. <laughs> okay, Gavin, thank you very much. Um, okay. I'm just going to hand over to Jim now, folks, if you just bear with me. Gavin, thank you very much for that. We'll go on to the questions um, later after Jim's presentation. So, uh, Jim, we're just going to let you take over now, hopefully. Okay, let's see if, <coughs> excuse me, let's see if I can, uh, can you see that? Yes, I can. Yeah, hopefully so, everybody else can as well. Hopefully so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, so Thanks, uh, no problem. I, I say I, I uh, quickly put together this presentation uh, on the subject of, of drones, drones in agriculture. Now, we started using drones back about 2013, 2014, and we've learned a lot, and we've actually developed a lot of tools to help us use those drones. Um, I should say a little bit about Soil Essentials. We're a a private company based in, in Angus, but we, uh, but we kind of work all over all over the UK and, and quite a bit abroad as well. We have about 30 people, all still based on on the farm, and we uh, we have a, we do a range of, of things from uh, precision agronomy with soil sampling, with the Trimble dealers in the north half of the UK, and we develop software and tools for precision agriculture. And one of the pieces of software that we develop is. Uh, a web-based piece of software called Core, and the link is that uh, Core is actually one of the tools that Core provides <clears throat> is the ability to uh, to go and fly a drone over your field, upload the few hundred images, and then we stitch it all together and, and produce a really high-resolution map of the of the field, which of course you'll be seeing in a second. <laughs> but first of all, I thought I would take you through a list of a list of things, a list of topics. And one of the first ones, unfortunately, with drones is rules and regulations. So now it's it's a great thought that you can just go and buy a drone and uh, and uh, go into a field and fly anywhere you like in the UK. Unfortunately, the Civil Aviation Authority would have quite a lot to say about that, especially over the last few years when we had the the problems with uh, with drone flying, illegal drone flying at at Heathrow and Gatwick they've brought in a, a quite a few more rules and regulations and our, and of course that will that will increase over time as is a way of things just to, so i don't want to go over this in huge detail but i thought it would be remiss of me not to not to say something about it so the thing is uh it's all online you can go and see you can go and register with the uh, civil aviation authority if you buy a drone, any drone now, from last November, I think it is, you need to register it. And there's a website there, register.drones.ca.co.uk. Even if it's a toy, even if it's oh, you're going to be using on your own land, you have to register it. It costs all of nine quid to do it. But uh, you get a little sticker, and you have to stick the sticker on the, on the drone, and that uh, tells people that it's your drone. But uh, that's, the way, that's the way it goes. It is changing all the time. There was supposed to be a new set of rules and regulations coming out from the CAA uh, around now, but that's been postponed a little bit. Um, however, the key point is, I suppose, is that if you're, uh, if you're doing it as a hobby, you can get away with just registering the drones, full stop. If you're doing it, if you're being paid to do it, as, as we as soil centers are paid to go and fly fields and buildings, if you're being paid to do it, you must go through quite an intensive training course and get your PFC or precision for commercial operations, and that's really quite a high level of uh, of um, training that you need to go through there. If you don't want to do that, 
that uh, there are, even if you do want to do that, actually, there are several rules you need to follow. Drone, and in the UK, the drone must always be in line of sight. Even if it's on your own land, it must always be in line of sight. It has to be less than 500 metres away. You have to be less than 400 metres, 400 feet above the ground. And it's above the ground, if you like. And you can't fly in restricted airspace next to airfields, uh, in security areas. And it's your responsibility to, responsibility to follow these rules. So that's the downside, because um, it is important. There have been accidents, and there are, there are continuing close shaves with aircraft all over the world. And uh, a, a drone is a small thing, but because of all the batteries and everything, it's quite heavy. And um, people always emphasize to me that, uh, you know, a, 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 a plane going at several, several hundred miles an hour, a drone going at 40, 50 miles an hour, if those two meet, something bad's going to happen. So please don't think that just because we're, we're in a farm, nothing bad can happen, because that's not the case. So what are the drone types and costs? Now, when we started, it was very much a fixed wing. We, we would divide things, drones, effectively into two. A quad or multi-copter. So a quadcopter has four, has four propellers, uh, all driven electrically, of course. Or a multi-copter can have four, six, eight, 12, maybe. You even get multi-copters that can carry people now. Um, and the alternative is fixed wing, where the wing, where the, uh, it's, it's more like a regular uh, plane or, or model aircraft. I, I suppose it's fair to say that over the last few years, fixed wings are, are, have become much less popular, whereas quadcopters, because of their ease of handling, ease of flying and flexibility, uh, they have become much more market leaders. DJI, Chinese, are, are undoubtedly the market leaders in, in a whole range of drones from, from uh, very much obvious or j just someone wanting to, to play with, uh, with a, a, a drone uh, right up through to professional uh, you know, flying agricultural fields and into the survey. So sur survey, you know, um, uh, people who survey uh, railroads and uh, and uh, motorways would use drones a lot nowadays. That's the problem of one of the main markets of drones. So and they they can be very high spec, but effectively now we've we've got to a place where really pretty much in, anybody the, the software and, and hardware has evolved into a place where really anybody can take uh, take 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 a drone. The plane, the drone flies itself. You tell it on, a, on an app where you want it to fly to. It goes and does it. It'll take pictures where you tell it to. Uh, it'll take video where you tell it to. It'll come back and land all by itself, completely, completely hands-free. The fixed wing is a little bit harder to fly because it's got various other other issues going on with it because of the, because of the speed it can't it can't hover. Um, but of course, you can buy these things. I mean, you can buy a drone for 20 quid, you know, from uh, from Amazon, but they tend to be very much, very much hobbyists and maybe uh, drone racing type things. But if you want to get something that would be useful on a farm, I think you need to spend a few hundred quid. Uh, you get something on eBay. Uh, eBay is a good option. Uh, Phantom 3, Phantom 4, Mavic are the kind of the industry standard. Interestingly, Phantom 4 and Mavic have evolved into really quite professional tools on the latest latest iteration of them. For example, some of the Phantoms we have here have got RTK receivers in them so that they can uh, locate images to within one or two centimetres, literally. I'll show you that in a second. And also they can have multispectral cameras, as, as uh, Gavin said. So lots of options nowadays, and it's really not hard to, to do, and you can just get them off the web. So when should you use drones? Because um, there are, there's lots of ways of getting Im of imagery. Gavin, Gavin said, uh, mentioned a few of them. The thing is, drones are good at some things. They're not so good at other things. And, uh, and, and the thing that's changed a lot in the last five to seven years is satellite imagery has become a lot more available and much lower cost. And the good thing about satellite imagery is that it is um, it, it comes across uh, automatically. You know, these uh, NASA, ESA, some private companies, they've spent literally hundreds of millions of euros or dollars or 
whatever to to put this this collection system up in the air. It tends to be very high quality imagery, um, and it comes across at a very uh, predictable time. And actually, so, so that all that means it is that they have to sell it. They, and indeed, in the case of some imagery from NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, they give it away free. So effectively. Uh, satellites have an advantage where you want to cover a very large area of ground regularly at low cost and to me that's production agriculture um, so that where you want to cover hundreds of hectares and a, a, a regularly that's where you want to go with satellite that's where you want to use satellite the disadvantage of satellite is that they come across regularly therefore you can't control when you want to get that image to some extent anyway um, so therefore they can be very badly affected by clouds. I think the current running total just now is that about this year, it's been quite a cloudy year, about 80% of the images um, that are taken by satellite today, you know, over, over the last growing season, have been affected by clouds. They're also lower resolution. Standard ones that we use would be three to three meter, 10 meter resolution. Perfectly good enough for broad acre agriculture, for spreading, for, for crop scouting, for looking, for spreading fertilizer on, on uh, cereals and tatties, but uh, you don't see the fine detail in each field. Where drone imagery comes into its own is where you need to get really high resolution. So with a drone, as you'll see in a second, you can actually see each individual plant. You can, you can mark different plants in a field um, and you can get images where you want them. You know, okay, you can't fly a drone in a howling gale, you can't fly a drone in, in, in the rain, really, or most drones anyway. Uh, so, but having said that, if you see a problem in the field, you have a drone in the back of the car, you can just jump out, send it off, it, it gets the images, uh, and you can you can see what the, the problem is, you can map the problem. But that with that, and that's that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. However, the disadvantages are you have to physically be there. You have to be there at the right time. Really, if you want to get good quality imagery, you should be flying a drone around about solar maximum. You know, so for me, 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, that sort of thing, 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock, maybe at this time of year. So, because if you do it out with that time period, the shadows are too long. Um, so, so that, and as I said earlier, the problem is it can't cover large areas. Um, I mentioned some of these earlier. The uh, European Space Agency has spent hundreds of millions of, of taxpayers, of, of euros, taxpayers' money to put up the Sentinel series of, of imagery. 10 meter resolution, so not too bad, comes across every five days, and it's very co low cost. So uh, one of the things we've built is a whole uh, web system, which I'll show you in a second, that automatically goes and collects those images of the ESA, ser ESA servers, processes them, cuts them to the the, the field boundaries and uh, uh, and basically presents them into the, into the that account. And we're talking a few pounds per hectare per year, really, for that. A really interesting uh, alternative is this thing called Planet Labs. I would, if you haven't heard of them before, I would encourage you to go and do, go and do a Google after this and look for Planet Labs. Um, they're an American company, started up by a Brit, actually, and they've gone completely the opposite way. Uh, the ESA Sentinel series is a thing the size of a small car. Um, you put two on a, oh, sorry, you put one on a rocket, you send it up. Um, it costs 300 odd million euros each. There's two of them up there just now on the Sentinel 2 series. They orbit the, the, the planet. They take an imagery every five days. They last for around about five years until they've built up all their, uh, burnt up all their fuel. Then they come down and, uh, and burn up and that's them finished with. Planet Labs have gone completely the opposite way. It's much more of a, uh, a mobile phone type of thing. It's using mobile phone technology to, 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 to drive it. And on the right of the screen, the two middle images are planet imagery. The, the top image is a Sentinel-2 satellite. You can get an impression of how big it is. The, the middle two images are planet labs. And you can see that planets are producing mi mini flocking microsats, or flocking microsats. They're around about the size of a, a big thermos. Um, uh, you can see them all on the uh, on the rack there in the in the third picture down. 
the, uh, the one of the biggest costs is, is launching satellites. So they they put 28 at a time into a, into the resupply mission up to the uh, space lab, and and to launch it, the the uh, astronauts literally throw them out the door. And if you go onto the Plant Lab site, uh, you can see a video of, of uh, the uh, microsats being chucked out the door, effectively into orbit, where they go and uh, start taking images. There's about 160 of them just now up there, and they they are imaging the entire landmass of the world daily, and that gives us a three meter resolution potentially daily. But of course, things get in the way. So there's been a lot of work done on on improving. Satellite, uh, getting satellite imagery to uh, to take out clouds, and another type of uh, satellite image imagery is called radar sat. So instead of using visible light, we are actually uh, shining, uh, emitting radar, microwave radar from satellites, bouncing it off the surface of the Earth and receiving the the uh, the reflection, just like a normal radar, but we're doing it on satellite. The good thing about this is that it can see through clouds. You can see, so you get an image every day. The bad thing is that it gives an image uh, that is very hard to interpret. And we're just about at a stage, I think, where over the next year or so, we're going to start to see really useful uh, tools where we're going to get daily imagery from radar stats and we're going to be able to transform them into, th th uh, into useful uh, management information for, for all the crops. And, and Gavin, I include grass in that. So I'm looking forward to that. That's something we're working on. So use is narrable. Um, one thing I've learned is that because of the really high resolution, so when you you, you send a drone off, it goes and uh, you you program the flight path just to show you were you were uh, setting, you were effectively telling it to fly up and down the uh, uh, each tram line effectively at say 50 or 60 or 70 meters high. You tell it to go off and fly, it flies, it collects three or 400 images, literally. Uh, you upload them to uh, a processing center like, like the one we have, Core, and Core stitches them all together into a massive auto mosaic, but it maintains that resolution. So you're effectively getting one or two or three centimeter resolution from that drone image, which means you can start off just like Google Earth. You, you start off zoomed right out of the, of the UK, you see the whole of the UK eventually in Google Earth. You can zoom in, then zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until you see the, the car sitting in your backyard. It's the same with a drone image. You can look at the whole field. I'll show you this in a second. Then you can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and look at each individual plant. So it's it's a great set of tools. You can see all the crop problems that are there. You can uh, map drains. Often, you know, when you see a crop uh, that's under a little bit of moisture stress, either too wet or too dry, you can see just the the lines of grains, and because these images are um, are georeferenced, you can actually map it. Then put that put that map out on our mobile phone, and you can then walk to the field and find that drain. It's really powerful. Machinery performance or poor poor performing areas of machinery, like uh, is something switching on too early, or switching off too early. Are we getting fertilizer overlaps? All that is really clearly seen in a in a drone, and uh, we've developed a whole raft of agronomic tools where, uh, where we have different, uh, say, potatoes, for example. We have discrete plants. We can, with an AI, a set of AI tools, we can count. We can put a little blob on each each plant and count the plants in that in that area of the field, and give you a plant population. And we can also calculate the canopy cover in that area as well. So to give you a few ideas, so here's Sentinel two imagery. Um, uh, and planet. So this is a potato field of uh, satellite imagery from last year. Each one of those little pixels is three meters by three meters. So that gives you an idea of scale. Uh, and you can see lots of things. The end rig there, and uh, a pass up, them, uh, you know, a poorer performing area in the middle. But if you start to look at UAV imagery, here's a field of potatoes from last year. I think it was um, zoomed all the way out. So this, this image has been collected by flying a standard DJI Phantom 4 over the field, getting perhaps 350 images, stitching them all together, and then producing a really high resolution uh, picture. But you can then zoom in. You can zoom in, I'm, I'm just doing this on the uh, PowerPoint, you can zoom in and looking at the, 
And if you do it multiple times, you can see the, so that's a, the, the first one was on the 12th of June, tw uh, then the 12th of July, 24th of July, 5th of August, and it's now beginning to die off. 12th of August, it's been sprayed off with the uh, regular one because we could use it at that time. So you get a really good set of crop history uh, from, a, from a drone. And the best thing is you, it's on demand. You can decide exactly how often you fly and uh, how, what you look at. So um, I was hoping, how are we doing for time? Uh, I, mean, uh, I, I was hoping yeah. we're okay. Um, footage. Okay, I'll go and, uh, well, I was going to go to core now. Can you still see that? Yep, can see that, Jim. Good, okay. So this is live, so something is bound to go wrong. So this is this is courtesy of HDB Spot Field at uh, Milton and Mather from Jim Reed. Just thought of it. so some some live imagery, as it were, at live as in uh, it's on on course. This is the this is the web page showing the uh, the images. Um, so here's one on the 17th of June. We've got another one on the 20th of June. And you can see it coming up. And there's one on the 26th of June. So we'll go in on the 17th of June, and as I say, we can see the whole field, the field of potatoes. We can, there's a set of trial plots that Scott should normally put in. And just to give you an idea of resolutions and things like this, we can go in and you see that as we go in, we are downloading higher resolution imagery all the time. Um, we can go in and, and then switch, switch on. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'll do that again. I'll lock it in place. It's good to show the plots because you get some idea of scale. So you can lock it in place and you can start switching on, on the next images. And then more images. So you get a really good idea of how things are, are growing. And we can uh, do, uh, as I say, plant counting. Um, uh, um, I think the uh, internet is just slow enough, so I'm not going to uh, go into uh, bring up plant counting because that's that's quite high volume stuff. But you can see that the resolution there, you can see the footprints uh, of people who've been out roving or, or inspecting. And then if we switch on one recently, you'll start to see the, the burn down, I think, of the crop. You see the tiles coming in uh, from the server. Yeah, yeah, internet struggling a little bit. So there's the there's the plots having been, uh, plots having been burnt down. Some crop of facelia there. Um, so that gives you an idea of the resolution you can get. And you can go from there right out to the whole field quite quickly, and it means you can see absolutely everything that's. Uh, that's that's happening in that field, and you can see all sorts of uh, any any problems that you that are there. There's probably little fertilizer trials, and uh, uh, that, that show up really nicely. So I'll go back to the the PowerPoint, hopefully. Yeah. Can you see that, Kat? Yep, can see that, Jim, yep. Excellent. So uses in livestock. Now, livestock's a bit more challenging. Potentially, it's huge. We've got a lot of, Gavin's mentioned a few, you know, monitoring of, uh, of grass uh, volume. But, but, but potentially, we, we can all imagine lots. So you're counting livestock, health inspections, inspecting fences, water troughs. Chasing pigeons, they don't know if that counts as, as using livestock, but it should. Um, but the trouble is, is that, as I said earlier, currently in UK, legislation limits their use. You've got to be in, in line of sight of the drone at all times, no more than 50 metres. Usually flies for no more than 25 minutes, uh, no more than 400 feet in height. Now, so that, that stops you really just sending a drone to go and have a look at the look at some livestock in, in a park, you know, down the road a little bit. 
Um, but effectively, there are other other countries that, that use it. Yeah. Kat, can you start that uh, that video? We thought we'd show you a, a New Zealand video. So, so potentially lots of uses. Um, unfortunately, what you saw there is not legal in the UK. But I thought I would show you what was potentially possible. Um, one of the other things that we think is coming along in the future is is, is targeted spraying. You know, so effectively, look at a drone. Uh, a drone isn't a model airplane. A drone, a drone is a flying camera. That's effectively what it's doing. And we can see that spot spraying is is going to become really possible with this because with the rise of artificial intelligence, we can use that to to run a model on a drone, a model, an artificial intelligence model, and det automatically detect weeds in a in a crop or in grass and spot spray them. So we've actually uh, again, this is uh, possibly going to go wrong. So we'll see. But uh, we've actually built a model, and I was going to try and show it. Give me a sec. Right. Hopefully, you can see that. Yep, we can see that, Jim. So what you're seeing is a drone flying about five meters above a, a crop of wheat from one of my crops last year. It has potato volunteers in it from the from the previous crop of potatoes. And we're automatically from in the drone's camera detecting that those ground keepers and the next stage is automatically spraying them. Um, we're, we've got a, a, an ongoing project at the moment within the UK to commercialize this and some of this. It's called a project called Sky, where we're using uh, cameras and potentially drones to detect docks in grassland and spot spray only the dock, not the grass or the clover. So that's one of the potential uses I see in the future. Uh, and just a final summary. Well, I think drones are useful. They're not, they're not the be all and end all. They're not appropriate for all solutions, but where you have a problem that, that, that they can address, they're 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 really useful. They're, they're really profitable to use, and actually they're fun. You know, they're uh, they're a, a great tool to to get you out there and actually to see things you can never see before. But just remember that legislation is really strict on how and when they can be used. Um, uh, you know, but I think they've got a stiff challenge coming up from satellite imagery. Some of the satellite imagery that's that's coming available will uh, will take a lot of the drones potential uses out and, and replace them with, with imagery. Um, but effectively, I think that at the moment in, in livestock, we are limited by the by, by what we are, by the range and the time they can fly and the rules that we have to abide by. So um, I think, unfortunately, livestock, it's a bit trickier. OK, thanks, Kat. Um, that's me. Yep. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Folks, I'm really sorry, time is not really on our side. Um, our webinar is due to finish at nine o'clock tonight and we're, we're just pressing nine o'clock now. Um, so what I am going to do is those that have asked questions, which we do have a few that have come into the portal, I'll put them to our speakers and get answers to those questions and get them to you um, in the next day or so, if that's OK with everyone. Um, I guess I'm just going to close the meeting now, folks. Um, I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight. I want to say a huge thank you to Gavin and Jim for tonight's webinar. Um, also to you all for attending. It is much appreciated. I just do have one final polling question that I do want to ask you. If you just bear with me, I'll just upload that polling question now. OK, folks, I'd really appreciate if you could answer the final question for tonight. OK, so we can see there, guys, that the results have improved, having heard um, tonight's webinar. So those that were not sure are really um, were on the fence with how they felt about technology. So, folks, look, thank you very much for tonight. I really appreciate your attendance. I'm going to close the call off now and I hope you can enjoy the rest of what's left of your evening, folks. Um, take care and many thanks. Good night, everyone.